<clears throat> for probably the last, let's say, 10 years, I've really done an enormous amount of research on disruptive technology. What changes our world? You know, desktop publishing, the dot-com revolution, blah, blah, blah. Right now, and I can't, I'm just going to give this to you in shorthand, okay, because I'm trying to make a point. The shorthand is, right now, the, the dot-com revolution was the digitalization of communications. Cool? Cool the same thing as that makes sense. So you, you all go, uh-huh, and I keep going. All right, so it was the digitalization of communications. Where are we now? We are right now in the, an era of the democratization of communications. Hardware, software companies creating um, the necessary uh, wherewithal so that anybody can go online. Here's the interesting thing. In the democratization of communications, it is the fact that the hardware and software companies are saying, if you buy my product, hardware or software, you too can now be a professional designer, photographer, photo retoucher, DJ, writer. You get what I mean. All right? Where, what's, what am I leading you to? Here is the key, and it's incredibly important because the ramifications, especially to everybody in this room, is really, really tough. And it is that the democratization of communications has erased the line between amateur and professional. Does that make sense? So last spring, I was doing a lot of commencement speeches at design colleges, etc., and I was talking about the democratization of communications and the eradication of the line between amateur and, and professional. And I turned to 250 or 500 design students and uh, graduates, and I said, so why do I need you? Why can't I just crowdsource everything? I mean, what the hell? Somebody got a Mac? Somebody's got, you know, you know Wi-Fi? I got a logo. And of course, they were all horrified. It's like, oh my God, don't say that. And of course, then I, I took them out of it. And I said, why? What's the difference between a professional and an amateur? Of course, we have process. We've been trained process. We've been given a legacy of decades and decades of, of history of our field. And more importantly, the difference between what we do and crowdsourcing is what we do because we have learned process is we can do something that's repeatable day in, day out, 24-7. And yeah, unfortunately to our bosses, it means that, that imagination and talent is a faucet. You walk up to it and you turn it on, ship comes out, woo -hoo. turn it off, go home. So why did I give you this conversation? Because in what I think is one of the most extensive market research programs I've been involved in in three decades, what it said to us was that print was healthy, it had its place, and more importantly, and I'll share this, some more information with you, but I want to move on, um, was the fact that all demographics really still have a vital link with print. Now, take that one step further. In all demographics, they stated very clearly that they absolutely love direct mail. They love, you know, magazine, catalog. They love, you know, anything that comes in the mailbox that's got personalization, um, collateral, etc. Direct mail is going to continue to grow approximately 3.3 to 3.5 percent compounded annually at least through 2018 where it's really going to grow. It's going to get huge. Why is it going to get huge? Inkjet, nanotechnology is going to start doing amazing, amazing things. Um, I, I, I have a blog, it's on, it's on the ETC site, and I recently wrote that when I went up to uh, Graph Expo, um, I was fascinated by what you can do now um, with a, a press. Now, I probably push p presses farther than anybody, but I was seeing printed electronics. I was seeing printed LED lights. 
I was seeing pieces with sound where all of the basic circuitry was printed on an offset press. I mean, come on. The idea that you're going to be able to get things. I was seeing, is everybody cool with OLED? Um, organic light emitting diode? Uh, I know, wasn't that just garble? Everybody goes, uh-huh. What, what are you talking about? Hell did he? Um, they are, you know what they are. It's called e-paper. E -E. They, it's, they're monitors that are literally paper thin. Literally. And they can be attached to magazines. They can be attached to cards. They can be attached to direct mail pieces. So we were seeing, you know, fold over postcards, um, kind of thick on the bottom, you know, a little thicker than usual, because those were the batteries. But you could open them up, push a button, and you literally had a video play for you that had been customized to your target market. So believe me, we've got some very, very cool things. So we decided that we were going to do uh, this book on direct mail. We hadn't done one on direct mail in about 10 years. Um, and when we did that, we called in our friend Trish. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Trish Witkowski. Um, she and I toured together when we did the Standard Four on folding. She has her master's in folding from RIT. How geeky is that? That is why, in fact, I have her photo here, because then you don't even have to question how much tape is on her glasses, OK? Um, she's the bomb. I mean, she is the package. Um, she's, uh, she is, in fact, she wrote an 856-page master's treatise on folding. She admits it to dry read, OK? You know, come on. But um, if you're not familiar with her, she has a, a site called foldfactory.com. It's also her company. She is best known for her videos. How many of you have seen her videos? OK, if you haven't and you are here, you must, must sign up. You can go to foldfactory.com and sign up. They're, they're weekly. Or um, you can go to YouTube uh, and just type in foldfactory.com. Uh, just to give you an idea, she does these weekly. This week is week 267. So yeah, she's got five years of archive. Let me say this to you personally. If you want the fastest education on direct mail design and direct mail production, watch these. Um, this is what they look like, by the way. Hey everybody, I'm Trish Wikowski from FoldFactory.com and this is your 60 second super cool fold of the week. I want to welcome all my new viewers this week and everybody else, thanks for coming back. This week's super cool fold is from my friend Marty Anson at Binda Graphics. Um, this is such a neat thing. It's one, it's a very unique fold, but two, this is the first time anybody's ever sent me a, a video of the piece actually getting produced entirely by machine. So um, you can either look in your fold of the week email and see a link to watch the video, or if you're coming to us from YouTube, you can check it out right on YouTube. Um, and you can watch this thing completely fold from start to finish, which is really neat. So this is a very unique treatment. I've never seen this done before. So um, this is combining a swinger fold technique with a tri-fold. So um, I'll explain a little bit about these two techniques and then we'll kind of go from there. So a swinger fold, um, and you can see some others I think in the Fold of the Week archive, but um, the, the basic technique is to use accordion folding and die cuts and short scores um, to create a swinging effect when it's open. Okay, so that's what's happening here is a die, short score, short score, die, um, which is really neat. But usually when you see a swinger fold, you just see this part of it, you know, piece of a cover, the center piece and a piece of a cover, and it swings like this, and they kind of are self-standing kind of. Um, very unusual, they use the swinger fold as the cover element, and then they added two panels. One is the back cover, and then this is a perfect uh, business reply card, BRC. So that folds in like this. The rest of it is, is really the production notes on how they're done. I've got to tell you, this stuff is brilliant. Um, she's very honest. She'll show you some amazing pieces, and she'll say, this is the paper that it was on, this is the basis weight, et cetera. Um, you can see that it's extensive. She said this was finished by hand, but they only did 2,500 pieces, or they did 3,500 pieces, whatever. Um, when, I, when she and I realized that we were going to be going on the road together, I had to do some quick background. So um, I wanted to see the archives. And uh, quite frankly, I would just sit down and I would watch like five of them or six of them at a time 
it would only take 10 minutes. But what I found, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, okay? What I found was every time I was watching something, I'd be writing stuff down. Like, oh, I love this idea, or I'm going to use this. I'm stealing this, you know, because, uh, you know, designers don't really steal. We honor other designers. <clears throat> but the beauty of it is um, she's, uh, she's got some great software as well. Um, she wrote that book, that 856-page book. She um, edited it down to 120 pages with the most popular folds and how they're done. But here was the cool part. She brought in a business partner from Adobe who scanned all of the folds, digitized them. They created a plug-in that um, completely interacts with InDesign. So that you open up in design, you pull down the uh, fold factory uh, from the menu, you type in the number of the fold that you want, it automatically puts it on your pasteboard, all the crops, all the folds, all the trim. It will, in fact, also take um, into account things like creep, um, gusseting, everything that you could possibly want, and more importantly, it then takes the die line and it embeds it into your file so that the printer can extract it. So for a hundred bucks, I gotta tell you, and I'm not pimping her, okay? I, I, she and I are best friends because I really, really do admire her. Um, but she sim she, recently, she just finished writing a book called Direct Mail Simplified. Um, she's also on lynda.com on direct mail. Absolutely well worth it. If you have a chance, by all means, see this. Um, she really goes in depth uh, in terms of all the folding self mailer changes and sizing and tabbing, you know, and the new address panels and everything else that you really do need to know. And a lot of that's in the book that you have in front of you. But uh, Trish and I um, got together. We took the information from uh, the print and research and her research from Direct Mail Simplified. We put it together, um, created this. And we wanted to answer the question, what's the value of mail? And quite frankly, in a time of social and mobile being as powerful as it is, although we certainly believe in print and we certainly believe in mail, not everybody else does. So very quickly, and I'm going to do this honestly very quickly, um, but we talked about the permanence. Um, here's a key, and you're going to hear me talk about this over and over again. Um, in all the research that we have done, um, one of the things that we've come to absolutely understand, we are a sensual species. We love to have our senses stimulated, sight, touch, smell, taste, everything. Um, if you all know the standard five that we did on special effects printing, I think it's really the apotheosis of it all. It's the Bible of special effects. But here's the interesting thing. Um, in the last year, in two years maybe, um, because of the research that we were doing with um, print and, I've actually taken on a whole new track personally of research, and it's on the neuroscience of reading. What's the difference between when we read ink on paper versus what happens when we read on tablets? And I've got way too inf much information. I promise you I would go into the bore mode, okay? But one of the things that neuroscientists have told us, the more senses that we can simulate stimulate simultaneously, the longer the monomic retention, the longer people will remember it. Does that make sense? So of course, you know, being a designer, now I work for a, a, a company that makes white paper, but I've been a designer for 40 years. I love text and cover. I love, co you know, wonderful textures and colors and everything else, wonderful simulation. And one of the things that neuroscientists have told us that are really, really important, once you've held your smartphone for a while, once you've held your tablet for a while, and you know the, the weight and the feel and the temperature and all that, it becomes monolithic. It no longer plays into the experience. Does that make sense? And the one thing that we have to our advantage with direct mail or even like magazine cover, etc., I change the paper. I change the weight. I change the finish. I change the printing techniques. I'm sending you a completely new piece that will capture your attention, guaranteed. The beauty of direct mail is as we parse through our mail, 
you know, if, if you've got a big handful of white number 10s, who cares? Right? But all of a sudden, I take that same number 10 and I have it converted out of a really cool stock and it's metallic or it's pearlized or it's translucent and I do that to you and you go like, oh, damn, gotcha. Does that make sense? All right, so here's the interesting thing. And by the way, um, on the, the website, I've got a blog and one of the things that I talk about um, is a lot of this, the research that I'm doing. Perfect example, on a tablet or on a smartphone. And please, do not for a minute think that I don't like digital or mobile or social, I spend an enormous amount of money and time on it because I'm fascinated by it. But with the mobile, you're only dealing with two senses. It's, ver it's the visual and it's the auditory. Not using music, not using background, not using the auditory as a part of something that's com coming to you on a digital doesn't make sense, okay? I, I shared with you that now we can do things like lights, we can do things like sound in print, but more importantly it's this, is the fact that foil stamp, die cut, emboss, deboss, any kind of special effects, um, I'll show you a statistic a little later, um, has proven to increase response rates by a minimum of 18%. 18%, why would you not do it? You know. A foil stamp or a die cut or a special fold or a special trim can do so much. More importantly, we can do scent. And now, and I'm, this is just quick sidebar, just between us. This is sort of after pizza talk, okay? Um, I received, I received a lot of stuff in the mail, direct mail. Recently, I received this glassine envelope, and inside was a postcard. The postcard was on a very sort of strange beautiful color orange paper, um, black type on top, and it said, printed, have you tasted our new orange? Well, obviously it was from a scent and flavor company, blah, blah, blah. And I look at it, and I'm supposed to pull out the, you know, open the envelope, pull out this postcard. They've sort of done a dotted line, and it said, tear this out and put it on your tongue. Now I've got to tell you something. <laughs> the last time I took a piece of paper like that and put it on my tongue <laughs> was about 30 years ago. I was gone for about three days. So I was a little skeptical about doing this, okay? Um, but I did it and bang, I got this orange flavor. It was perfect. I mean, sincerely, it was perfect. It was, or I was so impressed. I immediately called the company, told me to send me all the, to send samples. But then I called up all of my friends and I went, have you tasted this printed on paper or, you know, injected into paper? And the fact is, they filled the gap. They gave us the fifth sense. Does that make sense? By the way, quick other sidebar. I was telling this story and um, somebody sort of raised their hand and they said, um, are all of you familiar with Danielle Steele, the, the, the writer? Well, they were the printer for the Danielle Steele books, okay? And they said, in Danielle Steele's contract, swear to God this is true, in Danielle Steele's contract, you have to use her ink. And her ink is made by one ink company, and her ink is embedded with a rose scent. And then the next book will be embedded with a slight vanilla scent. So the fact of the matter is, it's not in the paper, it's in the ink. So as, you, oh, as you're turning the pages, you get this soft waft. And I thought, how brilliant. That kind of subliminal, sort of sensual aspect to a book. And I thought, we're really getting smart. I mean, it's, you know, anyway. So I wanted to say that. Um, the other part of it is what we were talking about, and this was really the key, and I'm not, I can't spend time on this. I wish I could. But the one thing that we've come to realize is that all of the experimentation that's being done right now in neuro neuroscience <clears throat> is proving that when we read ink on paper, this very big difference happens. Please understand that this is one of the most important takeaways I can give you today. 
we have become a culture of skimmers. Truth. I mean, if we're doing B to C, first of all, let me ask a question. What grade level do you write at for business to consumer? Sixth grade. Sixth to seventh grade. You cannot use a vocabulary larger than that. Everything has to be bullet pointed. Everything has to be highlighted. Highlighted, whether it's bold, italicized, underlined, because we have learned. Let me put it this way to you. Because of this extraordinary amount of content that we're being barraged with every day, the only way that we can keep up with it is that we had to train ourselves to learn how to read differently and had to learn to skim. Keyword, 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 link. Keyword, 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 link. Keyword, keyword, link. Done. But what's interesting is when we actually read ink on paper, we go back to the way that we were trained to read. We slow down. Neuroscientists have literally found out our blood pressure goes down, our heart rate goes down. We do, in fact, try to read word for word. We're not necessarily as successful as we might think. But what it leads to is the fact that we have a longer monomic retention of the content with exactly the same content or versus the same content if it was delivered online. Does that make sense? I wish we had the time, and I hope I can come back at some point to present print and as, as the full hour plus, because some of the research is just breathtakingly brilliant um, about what's happening from a neuroscientific perspective. We called it print and because we, it, it means print and everything else, print and all the digital. As a, as a creative director, what I've come to realize is if I want you to get my message, I absolutely want to make sure that part of my campaign is print. And what I'd like to do is to get that print in your hands first. Direct mail, magazine, collateral. And then I'm going to support all of that online. And now I've got a perfect campaign. 